Hello and it is great to be back with you here online with Restore. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Jodie and can you believe Christmas is almost here? Just not long to go now. And in this lead up to Christmas, this time of Advent as we call it, we're thinking about the Advent candles and the themes that they represent. And today we're focusing on joy. Uh, which means I get to spend time in a couple of my favourite passages of scripture. Um, but before we get to them, I wanted to think for a moment about our relationship to joy. And as I think about, and as, I, as I've been thinking about joy and, and being joyful, I've been thinking about how impossible or out of reach that feels for so many of us. And just how it seems like I just can't get to the point where I feel joyful about life. And the truth is, it's so much easier for us to be sad than it is glad. <laughs> um, and I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's the early years of human history where we were scanning the horizon for threats um, coming over the brow of the hill. But whatever the reason, the human brain seems to be more bent towards the negative than it is the positive. And when researching for today, and I love to, to look up facts and look at research and do a bit of background reading, and as I was researching for today, I came across the fact that it takes just three seconds to imprint a negative memory on our brains. Three seconds. And yet for a positive memory, it takes 14 seconds to imprint on our brain. And it just made me wonder, right at the beginning of preparing for this, how different our lives might be for some of us if we simply took time in those small moments of joy, of happiness, of delight that we come across to stop and be still for 14 seconds and let that imprint on our brain so that when we recall that memory, those same chem chemicals kick off and uh, we get those same happy feelings in, in days, weeks and months to come. I'm going to come back to that a bit later, but I just thought I'd start off with that thought. But the problem is it's so easy for us to focus on being sad and on the negative and all that's wrong with the world. We live in a world with a 24-7 news cycle. <laughs> we can get news whenever we want. Uh, and often the news, I'm going to say it, but profits off our fear. And then we add to that all the things that have happened this year in 2023, war and rumours of war and conflict, the increase in the cost of living. And then we add to that Christmas and the pain of that and the social isola isolation of that for some of us and the heartbreak of not being with ones we've lost and the financial pressure surrounding us. And it's no wonder that so many of us are struggling to be joyful and feeling like joy is out of reach this Christmas. And yet we love a Christmas carol. One of the ones we love is joy to the world and we'll sing it heartily at Christmas. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, let heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the saviour reigns, let all their songs employ, while fields and floods and rocks and hills and plays repeat the sounding joy. And it, we sing it heartily, but I'm not sure we're connecting in with that joy. So is it just wishful thinking? Is it just something we throw out there? Well, I want us to look at a passage and look at the joy of Christmas. And then I'm going to look at how we access that joy. So let's go on a journey together to Luke 2. If you've got a Bible with you or on your phone, then pull it up, Luke 2. And we're going to start at chapter 8. And that's just after Joseph and Mary have, have had the baby Jesus in a stable. And, um, and the angels appear to the shepherds. So off we go, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So there we have this this story of the angel appearing to the shepherds. And verse 10 is is the message right at the centre of it all. And it says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. That's it. That's the message at the centre of this story, the message from heaven to earth in that moment. Do not be afraid. Now, most of you watching probably already know that do not be afraid is the most common command in the Bible. Did you also know it's the most common phrase used in the Christmas story? Do not be afraid, fear not. Because fear is at the root of what has gone wrong in the human condition. It's the complete direct opposite of love. And I think simply, the, when we think about a journey of faith or our spiritual journey, our journey back to God, it's pretty much a, a decline in fear and an increase in faith and trust and love and confidence in God. And so they're saying, do not be afraid, do not fear, don't be anxious, fear not. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Now that word good news is in the original, it's euangelion. For those of you who don't know me, I do love words, and so I often explain a word. But that word euangelion can be also translated uh, glad tidings, good news. And what we miss out on in our, our reading now today in 2023 is that it was a word that was commonly used back in the first century. They already had this word, euangelion, because when a king was born or a a war was won, an enemy was defeated, there would be a a herald sent out, someone would be sent out to share the euangelion, the good news, the glad tidings. A a new king has been born. We won the war. The enemy's been defeated. And so they would have this good news, this euangelion. And so this angel, this messenger, is saying, I've got good news. A baby has been born. And it will cause great joy. And this is very cool. That word great is mega. Mega joy. I love that. Like mega joy. Who knew the word mega was in the Bible? So I've got this good news, this glad tidings of mega joy. And it's almost like something you've been waiting for for so long, just out of the blue, comes to pass, happens. And it's that feeling. And I think of just a few weeks ago, um, some friends of mine had a baby that they've waited years and years for. And they've waited and then boom, this baby has been born into their family. And there is mega joy in that family. And that's the idea kind of in this story, this good news of great joy, of mega joy. Here are the shepherds sitting, waiting, looking after their sheep in the dark, And they were most likely young teens, maybe even as young as 10, 10, 12 years old. And and similar to the ages my nieces and nephews are. And I was thinking about that, like my nieces and nephews, they do mega joy when they get good news. They kind of do this weird thing, they go, "Ah!" like they all, I've got photos on my phone of when they've been told good news by my brother or sister-in-law and capture their faces. "Ah!" Just this excitement, this mega joy comes out on their faces. And they just, it's just this joy. They can't contain it. And I think that's why the shepherds just couldn't contain it. They went running around telling everyone. Because they're probably 12 years old and they're, mega joy, this is amazing. And they can't believe it. This, they've been waiting for this Messiah to come. And then suddenly, out of the blue, good news, he's here. The king has been born. The enemy has been defeated. And that's the idea that this good news, the response to that on an emotional level is joy. 
And I think somehow we miss that. But the good, what is this good news that causes great joy? Verse 11, today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And that's it right there. That's the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings, the euangelion. I don't know if that sounds like the gospel to you. Because here it doesn't say in this story, hey, the gospel, you can, go, you can go to heaven if you pray this prayer. It doesn't say, oh, you can be healthy and wealthy. It doesn't say, oh, social justice is here for the world. Not that any of that is bad, but it's just not the gospel. They may or may not be byproducts of the gospel, but they're not the gospel. They're not the good news. Because the good news isn't about you and me at all. It's about the Messiah, this long-awaited Messiah that has suddenly been born in Bethlehem, just like the prophets had said years before. And he is a king, but not just any king. The word used there is Lord, Kyrios, which is like a translation of the, of the name Yahweh that, that Father God called himself in the Old Testament. A baby has been born. He is the king but not just any king. He is the embodiment. He is the living, breathing Lord, God in human form. That's the good news. That's the gospel. I love in the message translation how it says uh, about when, when Jesus came to the, to the earth in, as flesh and blood. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's the good news. God has come near. God has come close. The gospel is that Jesus is the long-awaited king for all people. And where there's a king, there's a kingdom. And we live in this, this strange time, as they did in the first century, of kind of the kingdom is here, but it's not yet. And we live in kind of this age, but also the age to come, which means we're almost trapped in kind of this age, which is an age of sorrow and pain and waiting. And then the age to come when Jesus returns again, which is everlasting joy, as Isaiah puts it. And so we live in this tension, don't we, of sorrow and joy. We live in this tension of living here on earth physically, but our hearts are in heaven. And we kind of live in this in-between. So if that's true, and not just a nice idea, why are you and I not experiencing a deeper joy in response to this good news? Maybe, I know there seems to be more pain and isolation than ever before, and I know it's been a tough few years. And us humans, we're fragile, we're vulnerable, we suffer. But joy is more than an emotion. In fact, all the ad Advent themes, hope, peace, love, joy, they're more than an emotion. If we think of them just as that, we, we kind of miss the point. They're about kind of our inner person and kind of our baseline, who we are on the inside. And our relationship to joy isn't, isn't passive. It doesn't just happen. It's active. Joy isn't something we feel. It's something we choose. <clears throat> Henry Nguyen <clears throat> excuse me, said, joy doesn't simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It doesn't just happen to us. So I find myself like, but I just don't feel it. We're like we're expecting joy to descend on us and make us feel all bubbly and happy. It doesn't work that way. It's a deliberate decision we make to joy, to joy in God. And that word, to joy, is the word rejoice in the Bible. It says to joy in God just means is the word rejoice. And that's a deliberate decision we make to rejoice. Now, I used to think, and I've journeyed on this, but I used to think there was a distinction somehow between joy and happiness. But actually, if you look at those words throughout the scriptures, joy, happiness, delight, pleasure, they're all from the same root. They're all kind of interchangeable in some ways. They're all together in the heart of God. So I'm not going to make that distinction between happiness and deep joy. I think joy, delight, pleasure, happiness, it's all there right in the heart of God. And I, okay, 
that sounds good. I think I want that. I want to experience this, this great joy on this good news that the Saviour has come. There is a king on the throne that God stepped down from heaven to earth. But how do I do that? As we live in this moment between those ages with a brain that is hardwired for negative thoughts, how do we move from fear that so many of us live in? How do we move from anxiety? How do we move from focusing on the negative and like the shepherds move into joy? How do we go on that that journey, that spiritual journey to decline in fear and anxiety and grow in joy? To go from sitting in the, the cold, the dark, the waiting, just like the shepherds, to a mega joy that is a result of the good news. I think the short answer might be spend time with Jesus. You know, for those of us who grew up in church and, and went to Sunday school, Jesus was always the answer. And in truth, he often is. The short answer is spend time with Jesus, praying in conversation with him, in community with others. But I want to take us to a bit more of a how-to guide as we explore and unpack this um, rejoicing in God and choosing to deliberately rejoice. And so I want to take us to one of my favourite passages, uh, which is not a Christmas passage, but Philippians 4. And I'm going to read verses 4 to 8 for us. So Philippians 4, verses 4 to 8. Rejoice, joy in the Lord, always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I think what Paul's written here might be the best how-to guide in maturing and growing in joy in the Bible. So we're just going to break it down for us. So verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. It's a command. Do it. Rejoice. Joy in the Lord. And he says, again, I say rejoice. Not just when it's all is going well and you're feeling happy, but always rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, rejoice. Paul's really making sure we hear it. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, that sounds great, Paul. That sounds great, Jody. But how? And so he said, this is how you're going to do it. Got three steps. The first one, give thanks says, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So in Paul's thinking, in Paul's understanding of God and of Scripture, the the practice of thanksgiving, the, the giving thanks, our attitude of gratitude, sorry, a bit cheesy, our attitude of gratitude is how we grow in our faith and in our trust in God and in our joy and how we decline in fear. He says, do not be anxious, do not be afraid, do not fear. Instead, be thankful. I think, wow, what what an opposite that is, that when I'm feeling fearful and anxious and afraid, Paul's saying, give thanks. I know you're not feeling joyful right now. That is really far from you and it feels so far out of reach, but rejoice in the Lord by giving thanks. And this attitude of gratitude that we give thanks for the life we have rather than grumble about the one we don't. And so we practice, and it's going to take a lifetime, but we practice and we cultivate this this thanksgiving by ritual, which means doing it over and over again, and redirection. So let me just unpack that for you. So we find ways to, to be thankful, to be grateful to have gratitude every day, every week, every year. 
And maybe that means starting your morning as soon as you open your eyes or the alarm goes off or, I don't know, if you've got a cat, the cat jumps on your face or the dog barks or the baby cries or the kids are shouting. But just in that moment, a, 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 th a thankful gratitude prayer just to start your day. And I just want to go back to that 14 seconds it takes to imprint a positive memory on our brains. I've got no scientific backup for this. I'm just suggesting it. But I wonder if we took just 14 seconds, we haven't do it, got to do a 10-minute Thanksgiving prayer or gratitude for 10 minutes, but just 14 seconds at the start of our day, that first 14 seconds to be still, to be present and to give thanks. I wonder what that would do to how we feel. Try it, 14 seconds. I'm sure we can all spare that. So that's kind of a ritual and maybe throughout the day if there's a moment where you start to feel overwhelmed or you can feel anxiety building are you just not, not feeling the joy? <laughs> just take a moment, take 14 seconds to stop, slow down, be present, and be thankful and give thanks to God. And then redirection, when those thoughts come in about how hard life is, how tough it is at the moment, how unfair life is, and those can come a lot. <laughs> so we've got lots of opportunity to practice this one. But when those thoughts come, to redirect our minds, to redirect our thoughts. I always remember Heidi talking about this. You know, when those thoughts come that try and distract us in prayer, but I feel like the same uh, illustration works. You kind of put those thoughts on a train and let it just track away. But we want to redirect. We want to redirect our thinking. That when those thoughts come, we redirect to what we're grateful for. So maybe it's a dark and gloomy day. But we can, and we're feeling a bit low and a bit, oh, life's tough. We take 14 seconds to redirect our thoughts and say, thank you, God, that I'm safe. Thank you, God, that I have a roof over my head. Thank you, God, that I'm warm. And we give thanks to God and let that imprint on our brain. So ritual and redirection over days, over weeks, over months, over years, over a lifetime. Maybe that would help us to become uh, more joyful people. We need gratitude more than ever. And I just wonder right now with me, I just want us to take 14 seconds. I don't know how you're feeling as you're watching this. Maybe joy does feel really out of reach for you. Maybe life is overwhelming at the moment. Maybe you have felt the fear and the anxiety rising up. And God says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. So I'm going to set my timer for 14 seconds. I've just got 14 seconds to give thanks, to stop, be quiet, be still, be present, and give thanks to God. Thank you, God, for the, the air in my lungs. Thank you, Lord, for the friends I have, for my family. Fourteen seconds just to stop, focus, and be thankful. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. How? Number one, give thanks. And then number two, he says in verse five, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. God is near. Remember, he moved into the neighborhood. He came from heaven to earth. God is near. He's not, God is not some far off, distant, uncaring God. I'm so sorry if that's been what you've been told or been your experience so far. But let me tell you this Christmas, God is not far off. The Lord is near. He has moved into the neighborhood. He wants to be close. 
And Paul says, God is near. Go to God in prayer. Take your anxiety, take your fear to God himself in prayer. He is the main source of our joy. He is the most joyful being on this universe, in this universe. And so our joy, as we get close to him, he will radiate joy. And Psalm 16 says, you, you will fill me with joy in your presence. And C.S. Lewis said this, and I think it just gives us the picture of what it means to be close and get, get close to joy. He says, if you want to be warm, you must stand near the fire. Not one like this. This is not real. But if you want to be warm, stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They're not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, hand out to anyone. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you're close to it, the spray will wet you. If you're not, you'll remain dry. So if we want to experience joy, if we want to have joy in our lives, if we want our baseline to be joy, we need to be, get close to and into the very thing that radiates joy, the source of joy himself, God. The formula to, to getting for joy is to get close to joy. Get into his presence. So Paul says, give thanks, draw near to God, and thirdly, kind of curate your thoughts. And by that, in verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's important we take note of what we think about, what we meditate on, what we chew over, what we give our attention to. Because when you look at Paul's list, it's the direct opposite, almost, of what we find on our phones, on our social media, in the news. If we read through the news, if we scroll, th scroll through X, formerly Twitter, if we look on Facebook, or don't, it's so often in our feed, all that is unno untrue, ignoble, wicked, impure, ugly, gross, of bad reputation, poor immoral quality, and blameworthy. It's the complete opposite to what Paul says to give our attention to. It's a complete opposite of what Paul says for us to meditate on, chew over, think about. And yet we spend so much time scrolling and getting what is ignoble, impure, ugly, gross into our heads. How are we ever going to fill our minds and bodies with joy if that is the thing that we're thinking about? All that humans have made ugly in this world, we're putting into our brains. All that humans have made sad in this world is what we're thinking on. So I want to make a case that we can cultivate an attitude of joy. We can cultivate an outlook of joy, just like you can of sarcasm and cynicism. But we can do that. Because what we give our attention to on a regular basis, what we fill our mind with, has the potential to point our life towards heaven or not. And so we need to think about that. And it's so simple in Paul's mind, that's it. Give thanks, draw near to God, and curate your thoughts. Think about what you're thinking about. Slow down enough. Let go of the life we wish we had that... So we can actually receive the life we've got with thanks and draw near to God. And I wonder this Christmas if we do this over and over into 2024 and 2025 and beyond, we might experience what Paul calls the renewing of our mind or what scientists call neuroplasticity. <laughs> But we become a person with a new mind, with a renewed mind where, where joy is our baseline now because we've Focus on the good news of great joy and other emotions will come and go. We won't just be these people who um, walk around with a smile on our face, happy, happy, happy all the time. That's not life. We live in the in-between age, remember. The, the not yet. We live with sorrow and joy. But our default setting will be joy as we, as we walk with Jesus. That's the good news. That's the good news of mega joy that we get to choose, deliberately choose, to live joyfully. Isn't that amazing? And I know that's not natural for some of us. Some of us are, are more naturally bent towards anxiety and sadness, and, 
there's all the more need for us to draw near to God. The, the great Bono said, joy is an act of defiance. And I love that. This Christmas, as you hear people moan, as you start to feel overwhelmed, or life feels unfair as you look ahead to, to what 2024, bring, 20, yeah, 2024 brings, joy is an act of defiance. Choose joy. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Let's choose joy this Christmas. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you that you are joy. It's not just a feeling, it's who you are. And Lord, as we think about Christmas when Jesus came to earth as a baby, you said that was good news of great joy. And Lord, I'm so sorry where where we've missed that great joy, where we've focused so much on the negative and sadness. But would you help us this Christmas? Would you stir us up to, to choose joy? In those moments of delight, of happiness, of pleasure, we we take the time to give thanks. And in those moments where we're beginning to feel fearful or anxious or overwhelmed, or we, we take a moment to draw near to you. And Lord, that we would make bold choices to think on those things that are from you that are good, that are noble, that are pure, that are excellent. And Father, I pray as we do these things, Lord, we would begin to experience a life of joy in a new way. That we would begin to understand that this good news of great joy is true. It's real. And it's available for each one of us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.